Good afternoon, folks. Welcome to today's webinar being presented by Mailers Hub in conjunction with the PIA of San Diego. We appreciate your calling in today and hope you'll enjoy what we're talking about. Um, this is Leo Raymond. Pardon my voice. I'm a little hoarse this morning or this afternoon, depending where you are. So I'll try to be not too raspy and, and, and grindy as we go along here. Um, as you may know, uh, Mailers Hub is a subscription service that uh, kind of looks like an association, works like an association to support commercial mailers and mailers who print and printers who mail and all those folks on their mailing and print and mailing and postal issues. Uh, we work with PIASD, of course, on, on helping uh, educate its members and today's webinar is part of that joint effort. So our, t our, our title today is, you know, you know about the rates, but there's more. It really kind of sets the stage here for a conversation about a lot of things, not just postal prices. Uh, but first, of course, about those rates. We want to talk a little bit about the standard mail prices, the marketing mail prices that you saw implemented last month, and some terms that were bouncing around during the conversation, like cross-subsidization and work sharing and rate relationships. So let's look at, at, at the rates that, they, that changed. Uh, as you can see on the right-hand side, the percentage change uh, in the class, within the class of mail, was not simply uh, all the same. Uh, for everything that, that constitutes the class, you, you have a wide range uh, of, of over 4% from under 1% change for carrier route to a change of over 5% for the retail form of every door direct mail. <clears throat> Along the way, you can see the prices for conventional letters and flats, about 2.5%, but almost 4 for some of the high density categories. So, the reason for some of this, in part, is explained in comments the Postal Service made, and you can see the highlighted parts there that are relevant. As you know, or may not know, uh, the cost coverage, the ability of the prices paid for flat size mail to cover their costs uh, has not always been adequate. So that means you have cost coverage of below uh, the, the, the price being charged. Uh, that's not a good thing. So the, the Postal Regulatory Commission, the separate body that regulates postal prices, has required the Postal Service to increase rates for flats at a faster rate than might otherwise apply. So the prices that were uh, took effect last month uh, were, uh, were increased more uh, than otherwise would apply to try to improve their cost coverage and bring that up to 100%. Now that's important if you're a letter mailer because the costs of marketing mail are paid for by all the stuff that goes at, uh, at that class. So if the prices being charged to flats are too low, then the difference, the, the, the shortfall, has to be made up by this term cross-subsidy between letters and flats. So the prices for letters may be a little bit higher to make up for the cost, for the prices, uh, price inadequacy, I should say, for flats. So keep that in the back of your mind when we go along and talk about these things. And in case you're wondering, you cannot go from first class to standard mail, for example, to exchange money, to cross-subsidize. That's illegal. But within the class, within first class, or within marketing mail, or within periodicals, you know, having one rate offsetting a shortfall someplace else is legal. So, okay. The, here's, some, here's some of the prices, again, to illustrate the point. Uh, as you can see, flats went up over 3%, letters went up less than 2 carrier route and the rest is sort of across the board. Now, there are some reasons for these uh, being the way they are, and we'll go through some more to illustrate the point. You've got five-digit mail being entered at three different places on this slide, at the origin, at your post office, for example, uh, in, in Poway or in San Diego, uh, another one being entered at the SCF, which I guess would be San Diego. And another situation where it's entered at the NDC or the, the Bulk Mail Center, which is the closest one for you would probably be Los, would be Los Angeles. So you can see how these prices, how the, how the increases uh, change. Now, it's important to maintain what's called a rate relationship. If you're going to have mailers interested in depositing their mail at destination entry, you want to make sure that the price you give them, the price you charge them, reflects a sufficient difference between that and what they would have paid if they just dropped it at a local post office. Otherwise, they're not going to go there. They're not going to bother covering their own cost of driving someplace. So you have to have logical rate relationships between, in this case, similar, similarly pre-sorted mail deposited at Origin or the SCF or the NDC. And the same is true for the saturation on the bottom. 
So sometimes you'll see the price increase vary between one and the other, in part for cost coverage, but also in, in part because you want to make sure that you have uh, logical rate relationships between one and the other. And this, of course, carries forward. Now, this is flats. You can see the price change here, how some things went up a high density. SCF went up uh, over 8%. Saturations at, des at the SCF over 8%, whereas some of the basic carrier out of the DSCF went up not even two. Again, cost coverage, rate relationships, and attempting to support some of the, some of the costs that are related to, the, to transmitting flats. Here, again, another example uh, of how these prices change. You can go back uh, to the price change yourself and see how all these things moved from the 2018 change until 2019. But when you look at these, you have to understand why they change, the degree to which they change, and the reasons behind those changes and the different per percentages of increase. So having said all of that, there's more to talk about here. Obviously, the Postal Service's finances derive a lot of what they have to do in, in, in terms of rate changes. So we'll talk a little bit about those, then about service, what the Postal Service is doing in different ways, what the Postal Regulatory Commission is doing, what Congress is doing, and some other stuff going on you need to pay attention to. First of all, we have the financial picture. <clears throat> the Postal Service's fiscal year goes from October to, to September. So right now they're in the first month or the second month of their second quarter. Uh, January, the first month of their second quarter, was not a particularly impressive month, although I've seen a lot worse. As you can see, the revenue for the month was a little bit above last year, but don't forget, we had a rate increase starting in January. Expenses, however, were significantly above last year. So that left them with a net loss of about $527 million, which if you want to look for some bright spots, it's $1 million less than last year. Volume for the year <coughs> was, for the month rather, was about 12 and a third billion pieces, a little bit better than expected, but still less than last year. First class continues to ebb. Um, for a single piece first class, what you or I would use to send bills and cards and letters, that's dropping faster than commercial first class, which sometimes has good months and sometimes has, has lesser months. Uh, periodicals had an unusually good month. Marketing mail was down for the, for, uh, for the month. And shipping and package services, the, the consistent bright, bright spot was up almost 6%. Now, what's going on in here? Well, you, what you've got is continuing diversion of mail, of course, uh, a way to, to electronic media. That's something that started many years ago and it's not going to stop. So it, we just have to accept that as a way of life. The problem is you've got some fixed costs. The network is still there. You've still got 155 million addresses or more every year to which mail must be delivered six days a week. And you have less and less mail being carried to those destinations. So the cost of delivery is being borne by fewer and fewer pieces of mail. That's not a good thing. You still have post offices. You still have uh, facilities. Those are fixed costs. And you have people. Now, the, the, the competitive products, shipping and package services, the, the problem the toll service is facing is twofold. First, the pie, the overall pie of e-commerce shipments is getting bigger. Even though the Postal Service is, is, is increasing its volume, its slice of the pie is getting smaller. And the reason for that in, in large part is because UPS, for example, FedEx, FedEx Ground, FedEx Home, whatever, they're all discovering that they are now having the density in neighborhoods to deliver the mail themselves and make it worthwhile Whereas before that density developed, they gave that mail to the Postal Service. So packages that would be dropped in your mailbox in some you know, re remote or rural neighborhood may now be brought to your door by a, by a private carrier because they, have, they can make, now make that delivery worthwhile. Looking at the year to date, the picture is, is not much different. You can see revenue is again up for the year, but that's because we had a rate increase. Expenses are up significantly and the net loss so far is over $2 billion, which is half again what, what we had last year at this point. Uh, in part, that's because of some paper issues. Uh, I don't mean printing paper, I mean accounting on, on paper accounting issues, such as re pre-funding repayments, retire, uh, pre-funding re uh, payments to, uh, to, to pre-fund future retiree health costs, to fully pre-fund retirement costs. These are things they're not, they, they can't afford to make these payments even though they're on the books. And of course, variables in the value or the liability for workers' comp. These are all paper adjustments, but still they show on the bottom line. Volume so far for the year is a little bit above supply. Um, 
first class is down, but where the bright spot was was marketing mail, standard mail, because of a blockbuster October. As, as the rest of the fiscal year goes on, that, that positive number to last year will go down and perhaps go below zero, but so far it's still held up. Again, the same trends we saw when talking about January remain in place. So this, this is something you need to look at now because people are going to begin asking you, well, what's my next price increase going to be? How much am I going to have to pay in 2020? I'm doing my budget. What should I plan for? As you may know, under the law, the Postal Service's rate authority, its ability to raise prices, is tied to the cost of living, the CPI. And a 12-month rolling average is used. Last August, the, 12, the figure at that point was just over 2.4%. So they figured that by next August, when they would, that, they would capture that figure and use it in their early October filing, they hoped it would climb from 2.419 to something, you know, two and a half points higher to give them a little bit of income. Well, as you can see right now, the rolling average is actually below what it was when they filed last August. And the bottom graph shows you the month over month change. And the month over month, it's been going, it's actually been losing momentum since, since last year, last fall. So unless that trend continues, uh, unless that trend reverses rather, and lets the Postal Service begin building rate authority, they're going to have a real problem come fall because they won't be able to raise their prices. And while you may be saying, well, that's awesome. It's not really so awesome if you're trying to make the Postal Service bills get paid. And for them, it could put them in a really significant financial squeeze. And in the long run, that's not good for any of us. So this is where the situation stands right now. If you, had, if you asked me how much, going, how much prices are going to go up, I really couldn't tell you. Because it, at this point, until the curve starts going back up again, as it did last year, if you notice in the top graph there, until it starts going back up, we're not going to have any idea of how fast it may climb and to what point it may climb. So this is kind of just FYI in case you're looking over the horizon. All right. The financial plan. Every year, the Post Office has to file a financial plan. And they did, of course, for 2019. You can see what they filed. And you can see what they expect to see. The significant thing is, is once again, down at the bottom there, they're just saying, we don't have enough money to pay our bills. And that's probably, you know, that, that, that's very, very true. Uh, so, it, it, you know, and they've said this before. They've said it almost every year. So if the Postal Service, again, does not have enough money to pay its bills, um, then, then we're going to see a continued situation where their, uh, where their debt is going to grow, which is now already third of $44 billion, I think, that they owe in all. Not a good picture. If this is your business, you wouldn't be in it. Service. Let's talk about service for a bit. Uh, up until the start of this fiscal year, which means up until the end of last September, the Postal Service used a, a process for measuring service performance, how well they did at getting your mail where it's supposed to go, that was heavily reliant upon sampling. <clears throat> As you know, that made it somewhat less reliable, perhaps, than if you had a more objective and global picture. Well, what happened as of the first of the year, the Postal Service was approved to use, <coughs> pardon me, approved to use a, uh, a much more uh, broadly based census measurement process by which the Postal Service would actually use scans of mail in process, what goes across the machines, uh, to, to, to begin to calculate how long it took to go from A to B. Now, what this means is when, when everyone uses um, you know, their IMB, it's, it's probably something which you fought hard not to have to do because it was an expensive investment. And, and it was something which, which for the long, longest time, people did not see why it would do them any good. Well, in this case, it's perhaps the first example of where you are going to get some benefit because now you're going to have much more reliable information, as will your clients, about how service is being rendered by the Postal Service. Once something goes across the first scan, once something is accepted by the Postal Service and scanned at the back dock, the clock starts. And then, then the, the, because every piece has, if, if you will, a license plate, every piece of mail then can be identified when it is going through its last scan and being sent out for delivery. To, and that, in turn, calculates how long, how, what the service was. Um, they even have a way to now tell carriers to, to uh, you know, in random, random fashion, scan all the pieces that they're delivering to an address. And that gives them a further piece of information about how long, how long it took for the last mile, what they call the last mile, from the last processing scan 
to when it actually goes into a mailbox. So with this new measurement system, now this very broad-based global census-based measurement system, you get much better information, much more reliable numbers. Unfortunately, as this shows you, the numbers weren't very good. Uh, for the first quarter of the fiscal year, which would be September, uh, which would be October, November, and December, you can see the bottom line there, their scores, what their scores were. The gray, the grayed out numbers are the year-to-date numbers, and for the first quarter, they're the one and the same. But, but the numbers for October, uh, simply, uh, for October, for the first quarter, simply were not that good. As you can see, uh, they're, they're probably below almost everything going back three years, and they're well below target. Well, we just finished our, our MTAC meetings at Postal Headquarters yesterday, and one of the presentations, several of the things, presentations talked about service performance, and there, were, there was no attempt, there really shouldn't have been any attempt to hide the fact these numbers stink. But what they show us for the second quarter so far, which would be, you know, one half the quarter, January and half of February, was significantly better, which it would have to be, because right now, if, you're, if they have any hope of making a credible effort to meet their service standards for the year, they've got to get these numbers up. And as you may know, in some, some places, San Diego is not one, but in some places you have consistently bad service, uh, and, and, and that's just not helping any. San Diego's numbers, as, as we show in our quarterly report about these things, um, are generally pretty decent. They're not top of the pack. They're not bottom of the pack. They're just right in there, doing more or less doing their decent job. So that's where we stand on service. Standard mail. Now, a couple of things going on with this. Uh, this well, really the two things, two parts of the same, two sides of the same coin. Last August, uh, the Postal Service issued a, a, a notice, if you will, uh, in which they talked about possibly limiting the contents of standard mail letters and flats to only paper-based material, which would exclude. So, you know, cards, you know, membership cards, plastic stuff. And, and, and the response the Postal Service got to this, notwithstanding their, their attempts to offer good reasons, was, was comprehensively negative. They got almost 5,000 comments. Um, I think that the, the yesterday we heard they had 17 who supported the proposal. So you can figure, what the, how, you can figure how one side of these comments were. They were evaluated by an MTAC committee. That evaluation ended just last week. And, and the committee this week came back and said they're going to issue um, further information about what they're, what, they're, um, what they're going to put forward as a recommendation. A lot of what was originally proposed is off the table. Uh, so right now what they're trying to do is redo the, the, the DMM regulations about machinability to make them more truly aligned with what machines can handle and try to figure out a way to separate out this fulfillment stuff, uh, which is being sent in, in, as the word implies, fulfillment of a request or an order for a merchandise item from a subscriber or from a customer or a client. So we have copies of this. We will be distributing that to our subscribers in the next issue of the newsletter, which is Monday. So that will give people a lot more information about what's going on here. But this is by no means coming to a conclusion anytime soon. So nothing is changing it as far as the current rules are concerned. But and any change that does result in this whole process won't take effect for a good long while, probably not until uh, 2020. So, okay, promotions. Uh, there are a couple of promotions going on right now, or registration periods for those commercial for promotions. So if you have clients whose budgets allow this, it may be a way to both build your mail volume, how much you can produce, and find ways, because these require certain types of, of additional features, to get some additional sales revenue uh, because of the additional work that some of these may require in order to qualify, uh, be it a design feature uh, or, or something else. Now, each of these uh, has, a, has a set of requirements, has a set of re registration periods, and, and all of these are available from the Postal Service's website, uh, actually postalpro.usps.gov. Uh, and that will give you all the details and there's a couple of pages of requirements about how to earn the, the, the register, how to register, uh, how to earn the discount or, or, the, or the rebate or whatever, and how that may be collected and paid later on. So this is worth considering. There are some that are yet, yet to come. As you can see, there's one that doesn't even start till late summer. So looking at these may give you some opportunities, as I said, to build volume and to get a little bit of extra value uh, income. Okay, the rate setting review. 
Um, now, the, the important part of this is what's in red. The postal services rates are supposed to cover um, the postal services costs. And if they don't, the, the, the law that was passed in 2006 said that the, that the regulatory commission 10 years later, which is 2016, would have to look at that system and make changes to make sure that those rates and rates cover the costs uh, for the market dominant classes. Market dominant being first class, standard mail, periodicals, package services. Well, they, they, the same law, of course, imposed this $55.8 billion pre-funding requirement. So from the get-go, uh, the rate setting process that included the CPI cap was really doomed to failure. So in 2016, the PRC began their review. In 2017, they issued their report. And their report included a variety of recommendations. And these are things that were within the narrow scope of what they could do and had to do. How can they make the CPI cap system um, pay all these bills? So they proposed a whole set of additional surcharges, if you will, two, three, four, five, seven percent, depending upon where your situation happened to fall in this. And, and that was what they said they, they would do in order to fix to fix the, the, the current um, inadequacy of the rate setting process to pay the bills. Well, needless to say, when this was published last, early last year, they did not get much support. It was very unpopular. Uh, so right now, as it stands, there is nothing going on with it. Uh, I think the commission realizes they, ha they have a stinker on their hands. Uh, they don't know how to solve this problem within the authority they've been given. And really, there is no good solution because, because if they raise the prices as they would have to do under this proposal, it would kill volume. And of course, what's the point of that? So right now, nothing is going on. Uh, as you can see, I think what they're doing, I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure what they're doing, is they're hoping they get some salvation here from the president's task force or maybe congressional legislation. So let's take a look at those. Uh, but first, let's talk about the governors. As you know, the Postal, Service, the Postal Service's board of directors, its governors, ran out of members because the Senate, for political reasons, could not agree to confirm people who were nominated. So finally, last year, uh, the Senate approved two people, Robert Duncan, a banker, and David Williams, the Postal Service's former inspector general, uh, to terms uh, and, and actually put real members back on the, on the board. There, was no, there were no promotions, uh, no pr price promotions, as we just discussed in 2017, because there were no governors to approve this. So if without governors, you can't file rate, case, rate cases and a number of other important things. So not having them for, for a long time was really a problem. Now there are two, and the president has, a, has, has, has nominated three more. Uh, Ron Bloom, Ramon, Roman Martinez, and Calvin Tucker, uh, who are, all come from a financial background, and Robert Duncan, the current chairman, for another term. So in the meantime, of course, you've still got this, this understaffed board uh, who has reconstituted itself as this temporary committee. The functions can go on, but to have, to have this major public institution lacking uh, appointed governors has really been an embarrassing circumstance for everybody involved. As far as postal reform legislation goes, uh, the last Congress, which ended, you know, ended in January of this year, was noteworthy for its lack of, lack of action. Uh, there were bills introduced in both houses of Congress uh, they, they, the one in the House got out of committee, but then its sponsor and the chair of the committee left Congress and nothing happened to it afterwards. That was still more than happened in the Senate, where they couldn't even get a committee hearing on it. So at the end of the year, at the end of the Congress, nothing was done. Of course, then they were all busy going out for re-election, telling you what a grand job they did. All, then the lame duck came, nothing happened. The adjournment came. And then the new Congress came in in January. So whatever there would have been done, whatever there would have been as far as the bill last year, died at the end of the Congress. So now, if there's any interest in getting a new bill filed, you have to find a sponsor and start all over from square one. What that bill would be, who knows? Because as you know right now, the, how, the Congress is divided partisanly. House in control of, of one, the Senate in control of the other. They have very different viewpoints on the economy, for one thing. Uh, business. So how the bill would be constituted would look very different depending upon who originated it, who originated it. But odds are, no matter who would originate it, the other house won't like it. So that kind of gives you a glimpse right there of how much is going to happen. 
Uh, now, privacy laws. You folks are in California. So this is going to really be relevant to you. Uh, last year, the uh, European Union in, in, implemented, after a two-year period, what they call general data protection regulation. And this is really a very uh, comprehensive and relatively strict set of requirements governing the use of information about individuals and protecting that information in after it's how to how to access it, how to use it, and how to dispose of it. Uh, and it affects anything being sent to addresses in the EU, including mail from the U.S. And it gives everybody responsibilities uh, in, uh, regarding who's, how, who will manage the data, how, and what they will do with it when acquiring it, when using it, and when finished using it. So the, the penalties, of course, are relevant to people in the, in the EU, but also to American companies who might be sending things into the EU. And the penalties, of course, may be not financial in our case, but might be uh, uh, restrictions on how, what could be sent in the future. Now, coming closer to home, last June, of course, I guess you folks would know, that uh, Assembly Bill 375 was enacted at the end of June. And it's very, very much modeled on the GDPR. So it regulates confidentiality, it regulates use, it gives individuals you know, rights over, the, over their personal information, and we were talking about it this week, and I believe it even gives people to right, the right to sue as individuals. So if you think about it, what that means is somebody can all of a sudden see a chance, or some ambulance chaser lawyers can see a chance to start suing people, uh, you know, for the, for the thinnest of, of, of reasons and in order to force them into settling. Now, this could be very problematic for anybody in California who mails or who uses a list for any reason, because it, it, it opens them up to a certain amount of, of, of risk uh, from what this law will provide. Now, I'm not in California. You folks are over there, and I would suggest that you find out from somebody who has legal competency in this area just exactly how much you're exposed to, do, to risk on this, and then take all, all such measures as required to make sure that you've done whatever the law requires uh, when it comes to getting lists, managing lists, disposing of, of the contents of those lists, notifying individuals, and so forth and so forth and so forth. Uh, this is going to be replicated in probably another 15, 17 states this year. So clearly what happened, in, what the, the, the fire that was lit in Europe has spread to the U.S. It's particularly relevant in California. So again, please be sure to, to look at this and to protect yourselves against exposure, the consequences. You may not even be aware uh, that, that, that you're looking at. Okay, state tax laws. Something else. Um, Quill. The Quill is, is, a, is a case that was uh, resettled re, re years ago in the Supreme Court. And uh, Quill, of course, was an office supply company. And the, the, the upshot of the case was that the, the, the company is not liable to pay state tax, sales tax, use tax, um, unless they have a physical presence in that state. And that was, that was the way that everybody operated for, for decades. Well, uh, last year, one of, one of the Dakotas, I forget which one it was, South or North, um, took issue with Wayfair, uh, the online seller, and on the issue of making them pay sales tax. And it went up over the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court overturned the Quill decision and said, basically, remote sellers may be subject to tax and it's based on state law. And the threshold for that liability was not set. So right now, you've got a, this hodgepodge situation, depending on what state you're in and how fast they've reacted to this, what their previous state sales and use tax laws were, and what, how they may be changing. So that if you print or mail within California or into Arizona or into New Hampshire, you suddenly may now have exposure to paying use tax or sales tax in either or both of those jurisdictions. Clearly, this is not something which any of us can keep track of from a distance. Um, and I, I think it would be very challenging for anybody to follow all of this unless you are a tax specialist. Hence the bottom line. To find out what your, what your exposure is, the best thing to do is to call a competent tax attorney and say, okay, you're aware of the cruel decision being overturned by the Supreme Court. How does it affect my state tax liability, my sales tax liability, my use tax liability within California or within other states and let them give you the professional answer that hopefully will be binding and offer you some protection 
Should somebody from Sacramento come knocking on your door and saying, hi, I'm here from the state tax office. I'm here to help you. So that, that's something else to keep track of. Now, UPS. Why, does you, why do we worry about UPS? Well, two reasons. Um, first of all, um, UPS is uh, a, a, the, 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 a gorilla in the room when it comes to uh, parcel volume, parcel shipments. And they, of course, are, are very jealous of anybody coming into their territory and taking any of their business. And, and the Postal Service has been nibbling away at, at what they do. They have a lot of business, and, the, and UPS is not very thrilled about this. So they're taking the, they're taking the, the regulatory path in the, now and to, to competing or to blunt the Postal Service's competition ability. And there are two ways they're doing it. The first is they're claiming that Postal Service competitive products, which is their, their shipping products, you know, partial post, a parcel select, priority mail, that kind of thing. UPS claims the Postal Service is failing to assign enough cost to that type of, of, of product and instead is shifting them to institutional costs that everybody pays. Now, attributable costs are things you can, you can identify as being specifically caused by a class of mail, a type of mail. Um, you know, first class mail has attributable costs that are unique to what is done to it, processing it, for example, transporting it, for example, the aircraft that carries priority mail and first class mail, the cost of that aircraft is shared between, is attributed to those two classes of mail. Institutional costs are things like keeping the lights on at the post office, you know, paying the postmaster general. They're not assigned to anybody. So UPS's claim is that, is that the post service is failing to, to assign enough costs to its competitive products. And of course, if they, if they won the argument, the Postal Service would have to either take less revenue, if you will, less um, profit from these products, or raise its prices. And of course, if it raises its prices, you can see how UPS would, be like, would like that, because either then they would raise their prices, or they would simply take away more business. So, the, so the, the Postal Regulatory Commission did not agree with UPS, so the UPS sued in the Court of Appeals. Uh, the Court of Appeals did not, did not agree with them. So then they asked the entire court, which is like 18 judges, uh, to, to hear it. They denied that. So now they've gone to the Supreme Court asking for them to review the whole matter. And, the, and, the, and they're hoping that the issue that the, that the court might find attractive is this thing called a Chevron defense. And this goes back to another case involving Chevron oil. And in that case, the principle was that it was a, the, the issue was deference. Uh, in other words, the court deferred to the judgment of the administrative body who's responsible for administering um, a particular law or regulation. So in this case, the court in the previous decisions gave the Postal Regulatory Commission deference because it should have the right and the understanding to know how to apply the, the rules that are relevant to postal costs. So what, the, what UPS is hoping now is that the Supreme Court will say, hmm, the PRC was being given too much deference in this case and that the lower court was wrong. UPS does not want to see the court say they were given the deference they deserve. They don't want to lose. Meanwhile, the second front they're on is the issue of appropriate share. The law says that competitive products have to contribute a certain amount towards institutional costs, 5.5%. UPS says it's too low. Actually, they're contributing over 24%, but that's another issue. So they sued the PRC. The appeals court held up the PRC's position. So that's, that hasn't gone any place yet. But, but the reason this is important to people who mail letters and flats is because postal cost and revenue, it's one pair of pants, just different pockets. So the revenues collected by the Postal Service to cover its costs are going to have to be generated one way or the other. In this example, if UPS drives up the costs that are associated with competitive products, lowers the revenue that those bring in, the revenue, the total revenue to pay the bills of the Postal Service has to come from someplace else. And the someplace else would be you. So in your case, then, if you mail letters and flats, the market-dominant products, you don't want to see uh, the contribution that these make towards institutional costs go down. You want to see them go up and improve because of better business, more revenue for the Postal Service. What's going on here? We talked before about, about the task force, the, government, the president's task force that was started up almost a year ago now. 
uh, given an assignment to Debt Review Universal Service, evaluate finances, and so forth. After some delay for a variety of reasons, they finally gave out their report last December. And at this point, we don't know what's go what they're going to do. Meanwhile, <clears throat> the, the White House had its own proposal last summer, and we suspect there could be some, some, but not necessarily a lot of linkage between what the task force recommends and what the government reform proposal of the White House was. Um, as you can see, the, ta the task force had a lot of re requirements, really giving the polls there was a more business-like situation, giving it more latitude to define delivery frequency, uh, giving it greater latitude to define service standards and how to deliver mail, giving it more um, more uh, more revenue opportunities, and changing its its um, uh, its its liabilities uh, to under the pre-funding liability. So you've got a lot of change here that could be good for the postal service's finances for its business situation. But this, as with the the, the proposal from the White House, as with the rate setting review from the regulatory commission as with what could or couldn't be happening with post reform this is all kind of just floating out there nobody is doing anything nobody knows what's going to happen so right now we're stuck in the status quo of the financial mess we talked about at the start of the program so that kind of gives you the overview of what's going on that kind of gives you the fast and dirty about things that are going to affect you besides postal rates so I realized it was kind of a fire hose of information on a, on a broad front. So let me see if we have any questions here any place, uh, because it's important to make sure that you have your questions answered. Um, do we have, Michelle, do we have any questions? I don't see any. I don't see any questions here any place. So if you, if you don't have any questions, um, of course, you can simply drop me a line. Uh, at lraymond at mailershub.com or just drop a note to your to your PIA folks and have them send me a note. Either way, I want to make sure that you have information. Now, um, because you're in the PIA, of course, if you really if you really want to get more information, get more involved in what we do, we offer dis offer subscriptions at a discounted rate for PIA San Diego members, uh, and we also can provide more information to your organization as you may wish. Either way, we want to make sure you're well informed about not just how to print, but how to mail and what's going on in the Postal Service. So contact us, MailersHub.com, or, or me, Al Raymond, at MailersHub.com, as you may need, or contact your leadership there in San Diego. And we'll do the best we can to help you out in whatever way, whatever way uh, that, that you may need, whatever way we can. All right, so um, I don't see any questions here, so I guess we're okay. Um, until we talk again, then I want to thank you for calling in today. I want to thank you for your attention, and hopefully we'll be able to share some time together once again in the future. Until then, thanks again. Talk to you soon. Bye.